welcome on this uh, wonderful day to a very special event, uh, special in many different ways, sponsored by the Science of the Human Past. Um, we're presenting the first ever public presentation of our very early, very first preliminary results, some of which most of us have the speakers have just seen for the first time in the last half hour. Uh, this is really right off the, uh, off the bench and out of the ice. And it's been accomplished by the initiative for the science of the human past at Harvard through a wonderful collaboration with the intellectual power and apparatuses and personnel of the Climate Change Institute of the University of Maine, with the Institut für Umweltphysik in the University of Heidelberg, uh, and uh, some of us here at Harvard University with help from the Université de Fribourg. I'm Michael McCormick, and I'm here today uh, wearing two hats as chair of the steering committee of the science of the human past, and as having really the exquisite privilege of being the co-leader of this extraordinarily exciting enterprise at the frontier of science, history, and the environment with my good friend and colleague, Paul Majewski, the director of CCI. Completely by accident, medieval people believed in anniversaries, ancient people believed in anniversaries. Completely by accident, I was looking through my notes and discovered that it was exactly 10 years ago today that Professor Michael McElroy, Butler Professor of Environmental Studies here in the first row, brought Mike McCormick together with Paul Majewski uh, in uh, an experimental workshop supported by the Mellon Foundation's Distinguished Achievement Award in which we convened here in Cambridge to explore whether there was any point for historians and uh, archaeologists and climate scientists to try to talk to each other. That produced some very humorous moments around 10 a.m. when a distinguished German colleague looked up at the slides and said, wait, is that 10, 2,000, 1,200 BP, 1,200 BC, or 1,200 AD? And one third of us thought it was each. So <laughs> it took a while to discover a common language. And that's what the science of the human past is all about. It is a group of scholars and scientists who serve on the steering committee recruited from different uh, silos and schools and areas of investigation across the university. Um, you've already heard a presentation this semester, many of you, on the extraordinary new evidence for the genetic underpinning of the Indo-European migration into Europe. We've got two, one and probably two more wonderful presentations coming up in December. One on the impact of high resolution radiocarbon dating on Anglo-Saxon archeology span and another on the latest results on the molecular uh, biology, the biomolecular archeology span of the pathogens of the Justinianic pandemic in the sixth century. The uh, scientific uh, partnership and friendship and friendships that emerged out of that initial meeting uh, continue on here today. And what we want to offer you is the very first results of the first measurements of an intensive uh, project which has involved all kinds of challenges and dangers. Uh, Nikki Spalding and Pascal Bolaber, who is joining us from Heidelberg via Skype, and he'll be able to participate in the questions, went to the top of Colini Fetti uh, and stayed up there and managed to get the ice uh, for this extraordinary project, get it back to the U.S. where it's been analyzed with the wonderful new apparatus, with the tremendous talent and ability that's assembled at Paul Majewski's uh, Climate Change Institute. And we've been working together to try to produce new knowledge about new data about the ancient climate that is of extremely high resolution. The possible impact of climate change on past societies has been the study of, uh, the subject of study by some very distinguished historians. But up until now, they were completely blocked in how far they could advance in their knowledge of the past because the written sources, while they are indeed rich for some periods, both in the Middle Ages and in antiquity, are not reliably well distributed across the past. Emmanuel Le Roi at Munich two years ago uh, declared that because of the new movement that uh, Paul Majewski has played a great role in, in producing new scientific proxy data, that is to say, as you'll see, material from tree rings, and in our case, from ice cores, that is annually resolved. For the first time, we can reach beyond the reach of the historical record and know things 
from, directly from the environmental, the chemical signals recorded in ancient ice in this instance. That is to say, Loi La Durie has said that our team has for the first time broken the sound barrier of the year 1000. For the first time, it's become possible for historians and climate scientists to work together and to begin to explore in detail what was going on before the year 1000. Going back to the time of Herodotus, Herodotus himself was convinced that climate affected human history and uh, explained much of Egyptian history by the extraordinary climate of Egypt. And that is what we are up to here. Um, and with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers. We're going to each take turns in presenting the new material to you. Let me underscore again that this is absolutely preliminary. This is brand new information, brand new evidence of a type and a quality that has never been assembled before. Uh, has never been retrieved, assembled, or analyzed before, and some of that will become clear to you. The potential is extraordinary, and I think you may come to agree with us that even some of the preliminary observations made by postdoctorates, by experienced senior professors, and even by a student in the college, uh, Matt Longo, uh, class of 17, have uh, really a lot to teach us. We'll begin by hearing from Professor Majewski, who's going to talk a little bit about the big picture of where, what we're doing and why we're doing it and the type of materials that we're using. I'll follow up with a little bit of a history of our collaboration and how we got to this point. At that point, Dr. Nicole Spaulding will introduce you to the uh, methods that we have, the materials, and some very, very early results. Extraordinarily exciting stuff. Then we're going to hear from Matt Longo, class of 17, who has spent his summer working his, um, his uh, energy off uh, with a scanning electron microscope and commuting to Maine, where he has made a very, very important discovery that promises to allow the absolute dating of different years in our ice core. Um, and uh, we'll move on and hear from Alex Moore, who has been studying the historical record and is coordinating the work of the, the team of undergraduates and graduate students working in the Digital Atlas of Roman and Medieval Civilization, compiling and analyzing and organizing the greatest geo database of historical information about climate before the year 1500 that has ever been, been composed. And uh, then we'll conclude. Uh, perhaps with a few concluding words, and then open the floor for discussion. There are distinguished climate scientists, there are distinguished historians, archaeologists, and good friends who are very smart in this audience who will have a lot of questions for us. Dr. Bo Labor is in Heidelberg at this moment, and he'll join us for the discussion via Skype. So without any further ado, let me invite my friend and colleague, Paul Majewski, to offer us a few words. Thank you. Well. It's wonderful to be here as uh, Mike McCormick in his very energetic, as always, way mentioned. Uh, this is, these are the very early results, but we're very excited about them. We've done something very different, uh, and we would like to get you involved in any way that you're interested. My task, it's an easy one for me, is to talk about why ice cores are so wonderful and what we have been able to do with them. Uh, ice cores provide us with, obviously, uh, records that up until now have gone back to about 850,000 years with my colleague, uh, two colleagues, Nick, uh, Nikki and Andre, we now have records that go back a million years. Uh, but we've also looked at very, very detailed uh, recent records that go back a few thousand years. And this is where, where Cole Nefetti comes in. We have the ability to look, as you'll find out, right down to storm level, even in very, very old portions of the record, and to take this back a long period in time. As you can see, there are a lot of different proxies, and these are proxies for climate uh, that we can examine. Uh, we've been able to calibrate uh, many of these uh, using uh, meteorological records, uh, uh, including uh, filtered, effectively, uh, massage uh, climate reanalyses of, of all sorts. And we've come up with strong calibrations. In the case of Greenland, uh, for feature, pressure features like the Icelandic low. Uh, we do this because we're able to track air masses, uh, and we do it because we've developed some new software that allows us to fiddle with a lot of these uh, climate reanalyses. Here in this really beautiful uh, NASA reconstruction, uh, where they've colored uh, uh, existing data, you can see in this light blue sea salt in the southern ocean, and in the north, the white is sulfate. Uh, coming off anthropogenic sources, uh, green 
biomass burning, et cetera. And you can see that these are a mechanism by which you can fingerprint air masses. Now imagine that you have 60 or 70 measurements that you can use to do this, and this is the way in which we have been able to track air masses all over the world, uh, as indicated by this idealized map uh, that shows you sort of a, just a several day sequence of changes in atmospheric circulation patterns dominated in this particular case uh, by the westward. Why do we care about air masses? Because air masses transport heat, precipitation, and pollutants. And this turns out to be a very, very important story if you think about what you can do if, in fact, you have records on a seasonal, annual, and long, uh, going back tens of thousands of years of how the how atmospheric circulation has changed. You can do what we did, which was to demonstrate, verify, and understand the behavior of atmospheric circulation in terms of abrupt climate change. You can look at how acid rain, the, the human component of acid rain, how far it goes, where it comes from. Uh, you can look at transport of lead off places, off regions that had lead abatement long after we did. You can look at uranium uh, coming off Australia and polluting by two orders of magnitude uh, the Antarctic uh, Peninsula. Uh, you can look at, uh, I can't see them from here. Oh, come on, here we go. Water resources. We're working in uh, Chile looking at how glaciers are changing. You can look at uh, drought, Arctic warming, on and on and on. We don't need to worry about the details. If you understand how the atmosphere how, how the atmosphere has changed over time and can label it, you can do a great deal. So, uh, 10 years ago, because of Mike McElroy, uh, Mike and I met, uh, Mike McCormick and I met, we started talking about how we could combine this extremely powerful historical record that's <coughs> way better dated than the ice core record, and we decided the best place to do this would be Europe, because this, of course, is very close to where the, uh, where the historical records come from. So we needed an ice core from Europe. Many people had sampled ice cores in Europe before. Turns out that Colmacetti, because of its location, provides the best preserved record. As you can see on the right, several records come from Colmacetti. So why, in fact, would we redrill this record? We drill, we redrilled this record because existing Colmacetti cores only went back year by year, could be counted year by year, 200 to 300 years. Using new laser technology, we were able to do something quite different. The example here is the GIST, the Greenland Ice Sheet 2 record, from which we demonstrated, uh, verified the existence of rubber climate change events. For 110,000 years, we had about 16 and a half thousand samples. Now, uh, with the advent of laser ablation, we can, for example, uh, several hundred meters down as the transition between the last abru big abrupt climate change of the glacial period and the Holocene, where layers are one centimeter and three centimeters thick, we can now get between 500 and 1,500 samples per year. That means that we could extend back in time the Colmacetti record if we got a new one. So we went and we got that record. We've subjected it to this absolute dramatic change in the ability to, to analyze records at, at orders of magnitude higher resolution. We did this because of a generous grant from Arcadia given to Mike McCormick and the rest of us. Uh, and from here, I'll turn it on so that you can hear about the details. So I'm going to go ahead and provide a little more detail on why, of all of the glaciers in Europe, would we choose to core at Colonifetti. Colonifetti is, is a relatively small glacier. It's only about 600 feet across, and you can see in the photo on the screen that it would be possible for wind to blow from one side to, to the other, removing material as it goes with nothing to prevent it from doing so. A consequence of this is that only about 10% of the snow that falls annually will remain on the surface long enough to be archived within the glacier. Most of that 10% is snow that falls during the summer, and this has particular relevance for our historical comparisons. 
So another consequence of this wind-driven system is the, that the amount of snow that falls is incredibly variable in space and time. If you looked at each of these different ice core sites, some of which Paul showed earlier, they might have slightly different accumulation rates. But generally, we're looking about two to three feet per year. Now that's a relatively low rate of accumulation, and what that means is despite it being only about 300 feet thick, we can archive a tremendous amount of years within this glacier. And that's really what makes it unique. Kolonafeti seems to be the only glacier within Europe from which it would be possible to collect an ice core spanning several thousand years. So given its unique nature, a tremendous amount of work has already been done there. In fact, this year marks the 40th anniversary of ice coring at Kolonafeti. There'll be a special session held at the Swiss Geoscience <coughs> meeting later this month, and Pascal, who we have here on Skype, will be giving a keynote lecture at that session. So some of the information that has been gleaned from the glacier throughout the last 40 <coughs> years provides additional evidence beyond the arithmetic of annual accumulation versus depth that we should be able to find very old ice there. So what I have on the screen now is a table from a paper by Yank et al. in, two, in 2009. And what they've done is radiocarbon analyses of different sections throughout the ice core. I know there's a lot of numbers up there, but what I really want you to look at is within that pink bar, far to the left, we see that the radiocarbon age for the basal section, so the bottommost section, is greater than 15,200 years before present. So there should be very old ice there. That said, to this point, no research group has been able to create a chronology that goes much beyond the last 200 years. And to really understand why that's the case, we have to back up a little bit from Paul's talk and think about what we're looking at when we analyze ice cores. Essentially, we're looking at chemical variation with depth. So we expect to see regular increases above a background level related to seasonal processes. For example, at Kolonafeti, we have deep convective mixing of clean mid-tropospheric air with relatively polluted ground level air, and that results in a spike in a variety of elements um, as they're deposited on the surface of the glacier. Um, another way to think about this is that we can count um, that seasonal variation. So in the example that I have on the screen here, um, we're actually looking at stable oxygen isotopes. So we're looking at the ratio of heavy to light oxygen uh, called delta 18O. Alex will talk a little bit about this later, but this is often used as a proxy for temperature. So we have um, for each of the white years that's listed, we have a red-blue couplet where a negative value is indicative or a more negative value is indicative of a colder temperature, so that would be a winter, and a higher or less negative value would be in indicative of a warmer temperature or a summer, and we can count that. We'll also look at larger but more irregular variations that might result from the deposition of volcanic aerosols, mineral dust, or anthropogenic pollutants, and Matt will talk a little bit about some of those volcanic aerosols um, later. So the problem at Kolonafeti has thus far been that the methods that we use to analyze ice cores, which involve melting the ice, are, in, are incapable of producing a sample um, that's small enough to, to capture this regular variation once we get lower in the ice core, where that already thin layer deposited at the surface has been compressed by newly falling snow. So the only way forward was to develop new instrumentation. And that's what we've done, as Paul already introduced, at the University of Maine Climate Change Institute's WM Tech Laser Ice Facility. We use a system um, that requires an intense burst of energy delivered by a short laser pulse to sample the ice core. The diameter of the laser beam is about 100 microns, which is the average thickness of a single human hair. What that means is that as we traverse along the surface, we can analyze as many as 50,000 unique points along a three foot or one meter ice core, which is pretty standard um, for the ice coring community. This should be compared to the 200 that you could get from the absolute best um, melt-based method. So this truly is a revolutionary system, and using this, we've been able to um, greatly or improve our resolution. So we have, with this system, um, collected 1.5 million measurements from the 30, um, from about 90 feet of our 210-foot ice core, and that's the lowermost section. We've used those in combination with a couple measurements, uh, 30 additional elements from the melt-based systems called continuous flow analysis, or CFA, to create an age depth scale. So what I'm showing on the screen is calcium from the laser in red at the very top. This has been smoothed. Um, 
calcium from the CFA in the middle and ammonium from the CFA at the bottom. Uh, CFA ammonium is his, what's historically been used as an indicator of seasonal variability at Colonifeti because it, where it's coming from is the uplift of soil dust um, during that convective mixing each summer, so from the surrounding valley. This plot is important to us for a variety of reasons. First, it shows that um, there is that the ammonium signal is comparable to the calcium signal. This is important because in the past we've only used the ammonium for this type of thing. Um, and what it also shows is that the laser calcium at a depth where the, where the size of those individual layers is large enough to still resolve them within the melt base system is very, very similar um, to what we see in the CFA. So this gives us confidence that when those layers are too small at the bottom of the ice core to resolve with the melt base system, we're safe to use the laser calcium um, on its own. So using these um, measurements, we have counted each of the individual layers much the same way that you could do with those spikes um, that we saw earlier on the Delta 18 plot. So what I'm showing here is an example of how we might have gone along and counted those individual layers. Um, the black would be years that we're confident in and the gray would be layers that we're not so certain of. And adding those not so certain years is a way that we can account for that um, uncertainty in our time scale associated with the irregular snow deposition. So doing this, we have gone back to about um, 1500 BC, which is a lot farther back than 2000 or 200 years ago. We can also use the, the irregular events like those volcanic aerosols to create further confidence in our time scale, which is something that Matt will talk to you a little bit about later, as well as measurements of radiocarbon, um, which are being conducted and developed at Heidelberg University. So because of the number of ice cores that have been collected at Colonifeti, we have other ways that we can think about um, how well we've created this time scale. What I'm showing you on the screen now is again the Delta 18 um, from two separate ice cores, one um, that was collected in 2013 in blue and another collected uh, in 2005 about 100 meters away in red. What we can see is that there is very good correspondence between these two records, which suggests to us that we're looking at the, uh, the imprint of an atmospheric signal rather than some depositional noise, and that's very positive. We can also see, sorry, we can also see that there are um, a couple different large lifts in the, in the record, for example, this one at 1250 or 1260 AU, and that corresponds to a very well-known volcanic eruption. Um, so that gives us additional confidence that our time scale um, is pretty good. So before jumping into the comparison with the historical record, we wanted to make sure that we had sort of quality checked what we're seeing in the ice core. And to do that, we chose to look for um, whether or not it was possible to reconstruct known patterns of atmospheric circulation using the data we collected from the ice core. So the deposition of Saharan dust at Colonifeti is pretty well established and there are two different pathways that this usually um, happens by. What I'm showing on the screen now is, thank you, um, what I'm showing on the screen now is winds at the 500 millibar level. So at this level, weather systems and precipitation are usually following those winds, and that's about 18,000 feet above sea level if, we're, if we want to think about where we are on average. And what we can see here is that there are two different pathways. So the first is a direct pathway where you have, um, where you have air blowing from the Sahara directly north across the Mediterranean to be deposited at the Alps. So this is a south to north flow. In the indirect pathway over here, we have this anticyclonic or clockwise diversion of this dust and or of this wind and entrained dust out to the Atlantic before it comes back down to be deposited at Colonifeti via via a north south flow. So in order to look for these things within our ice core, we use the same program or software system that Paul was talking about earlier. This is um, Climate Reanalyzer, which was developed by um, Sean Burkle, who's the main state climatologist. He's also a member of the Climate Change Institute. And we can use this to look for correlations between um, what we see in our record in terms of different elements and those atmospheric patterns. So this, I know, probably looks very, very complicated, um, but this is going to be the indirect method. So what we see here, again, we're looking at the 500 millibar level. We're looking at vertical winds. So if we have a positive correlation, one of these orange colors 
then our ratio of silica to aluminum, which are both dust elements, are going to be positive if the increase in silica to aluminum is associated with Sorry, silica to, excuse me, silica to aluminum ratios. So we have um, a positive association out here in the Atlantic, which means that if the, the wind is blowing from the south to the north, and that is, is correlated with increasing silica to iron, whereas over farther to the east, we have a negative correlation, which means that increasing silica to iron is associated with north to south flow. So this replicates that indirect method that we talked about earlier. If we look at a different um, set of elements, if we look at aluminum to calcium, we see the opposite pattern where we have that positive correlation with south to north winds occurring where it would be possible to see direct flow from the Sahara um, to the Alps. So this is a really great thing for us to see because it proves to us that we are able to reconstruct atmospheric patterns using the proxies that we have in the ice core. And it also suggests that in the future, we should be able to use these um, measurements to think about which geographic regions are being impacted by other climate phenomena observed in the ice core. <coughs> so because um, in the past, we have only been able to look at those things that would be happening on sort of more of longer time scales um, because of this time scale or because of this chronology problem, now we're able to look at things that are happening on less than decadal events. The most obvious place to start is volcanic eruptions. Um, so for example, I'm showing here this eruption of 1815, which caused a year without a summer. Um, and there are ter various um, potential historical associations listed across the bottom. And this is something that we can use a benchmark for looking at unknown, uh, the unknown climate phenomenon or unknown events. Um, if we see this amount of, uh, this amount of associations or this amount of records within the historical accounts, we can use that to sort of calibrate what we might see at other events with a similar temperature decrease. We're interested in things other than temperature as well, and this is something that is really very new. We haven't done much with this yet. These are fresh off the ice core. As Mike said earlier, these are measurements from the laser, and we're looking at things that might suggest the impact of humans on the environment rather than the impact of the environment on humans. So for example, what I'm showing here is measurements of lead and copper from the ice core, which could suggest smelting activities. We haven't really done much with this, we've, um, but this is something that we look forward to talking to you about in the future. So I think Matt will speak now about some of the TEFRA work. Hi everyone, uh, so I'm Matt Luongo and I'm a junior at the college. Uh, I'm a double major in earth science and environmental engineering and I can honestly say that I never thought that my Roman history professor would pull me into doing scientific research, but that's just how it worked out. Um, so I spent a weekend over the summer going to Maine and we looked through a scanning electron microscope at ice chips from the Colne uh ice core and we were looking for volcanic tephra, which is pieces of volcanic glass which are small and can fly through the air and land on this glacier. And first of all, people did not ever think that this would actually uh, be in the glacier because of different atmospheric circulation patterns. So we were looking for it and we think we found it, which is a good idea, or which is a good thing. Um, so what we found was we fingerprinted the tephra to the 1875 Oskia eruption, which is in Iceland. Uh, it's the largest Icelandic volcanic eruption in recent history since the last glaciation. And we have a lot of different historical records from that. So I spent some time after getting the data, plotting all of these. This is the, you'll see in Red, that's our data, that's the tephra that we found in the ice core, and in green, that is literature data on the Oskia eruption. And we plotted the silica against the 10 major elements uh, for tephra. And 
We just kind of fingerprinted it. Okay, in, in the future, um, I will. The ones on top are red, and the ones on bottom are green. Oh, okay. oh no, not all red. Oh, oh, again. Oh, 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 sorry. <laughs> Next time. Next time. Next time. Thank you. Okay, modules. Okay, okay, so we were using the 10 major elements to look at the tephra, so really we were just fingerprinting it, and I spent a lot of time plotting, and eventually we found this Icelandic uh, match, which was Askia, and it made sense that we would find it because it was the largest eruption recently and the pathway circulation goes back to what Nikki said, that was the indirect circulation, so clearly some massive atmosphere downwind of Iceland brought this tephra to the core. And then this is my last slide, it's just showing on a mineral chart where our tephra was, they're rhyolitic, and that when I made that plot, that was when uh, we first realized that we probably had something because a lot of times the green dots wouldn't even show up on the plot. So, yeah. Matt's discovery is really important. Uh, up until now, as Matt said, the conventional wisdom is that there are no tephra in alpine glaciers. That means if you write a grant to try and date absolutely your ice core by the volcanic tephra, you're not going to get a grant. It's very expensive to do. Now Matt, working with Andrei Kubatov at the CCI, has been able to prove that volcanic, identifiable volcanic tephra are in our ice core, are in the alpine glaciers, and date absolutely that particular piece of ice. So it is a, a very important advance in multiple levels. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in uh, initiative of, for the science of the human past here at Harvard this semester, and I'm also a lecturer here. Uh, I'll be presenting a very short um, comparison of the uh, ice core proxies of the ice core indicators for of climate with uh, our historical uh, data. And so here we return to the, the oxygen isotope graph that Nikki already presented earlier, but this, uh, this one plot is just slightly different. Uh, you can't even notice it, but it's just slightly different because we have shifted the, I have shifted, I will take responsibility, the whole um, graph about seven years forward. Why have I done that? Because the graph indicates uh, temperature. It's a proxy for temperature. Uh, it is not a completely straightforward uh, translation from the chemical analysis to temperature, but it's a pretty good indicator. And right here, we have the biggest temperature drop in our record. And uh, so if you just take a, a stock of this, well, recently uh, there, has been, uh, there have been several studies of tephra particles and, and also ice core deposits, which have shown that the uh, volcanic eruption of 1257, originally stated 1258, but in fact 1257 from the Mount, the Mount Rinjani complex in uh, Indonesia created a year without a summer again uh, in the year 1257. And that's what uh, we hypothesize this is. And again, this, these are preliminary comparisons of the uh, ice core data, scientific data, and historical data. Nonetheless, this is the, the publication that established uh, Mount Rinjani as the origin of the eruption and made the, the popular news as well. That's what it looks like, just for your eye candy factor. Uh, it's still very active. And so what we're doing is, again, we're taking the ice core data, the chemical analysis of the ice core data that's been done uh, by our colleagues in Maine, and we're, we're trying to compare it to the historical record uh, from uh, medieval sources, pre-modern and pre-modern sources. And so here we go. I selected out the data from 1200 to 1550, which includes the 1257 event. And these are historical reports of bad harvests. 
And you can see that there is an association, a pretty strong one, between uh, the two data sets. Again, preliminary, but still pretty good uh, association between the two. And so what we should uh, particularly take note of is this period between 13, 1300 and 1350, in our narrative of Western history, we think of 1315 to 1325, especially in Northern Europe, as a phenomenon called the Great Famine, a period of exceptionally bad weather that marked the beginning of a colder period after the so-called medieval uh, warm optimum, which was before 1300. This would be indicated right here. And in fact, we see that if the data holds up, this is in fact a much broader phenomenon, not just a decade, but in fact uh, more like 50 years. And the data, as we will see in the last slide, comes from all over Europe, not just Northern Europe. So it's a much broader phenomenon, both chronologically and geographically, of bad weather, bad harvests. And uh, there is some association uh, between the bad harvests and the temperature. And so, and the same can be said, although with less, less certainty, for the precipitation record. This is precipitation record, again, for only summer reports because Colony Fetti gives us mainly a summer signal, as Paul has indicated earlier. And again, we see a, wet, a wetter period starting in 1300 and continuing compared to the previous period, continuing all the way to 1350 and beyond. Once calibrated, and, and what are the implications of this for health? Well, there, has been, there have been several articles, uh, this is one from a year ago by Anne Carmichael, that have posited that the increased wet conditions have increased also populations of fleas, which of course were the vector uh, for Yersinia pestis, which was uh, bubonic plague that in fact culminated in the 1347, uh, 1348 and beyond epidemic pandemic that decimated Europe, uh, about 30 to 50% of the population is estimated to have died. And in fact, what Anne, was, what Anne Carmichael was uh, suggesting was that increased wet conditions may have influenced uh, the morbidity, that is how easily the, the disease was uh, transmitted from animals to people. That's how bubonic plague um, uh, has historically been understood to, to be transmitted. Uh, through fleas jumping from rats or gerbils or other rodents to uh, people. And so she is in fact supported by uh, our preliminary evidence here that in fact there was a wetter period and morbidity may have been increased. In addition, archeological evidence from uh, Britain um, from 2008 shows that in fact there is a pretty strong evidence that uh, continued malnourishment in, in European populations increased mortality. So one, if, if a person who had been malnourished for several years, maybe a decade, maybe more, contracted the disease, Yersinia pestis, bubonic plague, it was much more likely to die than a healthier, well-fed person. In this case, this is obviously has implications for us because we have just seen that we have bad harvests uh, which associate with uh, lower temperatures and uh, wetter conditions. So in fact, the climate may very well have created the best substrate for the plague to take root in 1347 and uh, devastate most of the population, well, a good chunk of the population of Europe. So that's the Black Death right there in time, that is. That's what 1347 is, and that's the period that we're talking about. So you can, you can clearly see that if the data holds up, and the resolution of the oxygen isotopes, which is in fact decadal, once, once uh, uh, improved by uh, further analysis, will hold up with the annual resolution of our historical data. Uh, we may very well here have substantial findings uh, that indicate that uh, all of these reports from all over Europe, all over Europe, this is the first the decade before the plague, uh, are in fact showing a new understanding of the, of the medieval environment of, of, of the decade preceding uh, the bubonic plague known as the Black Death uh, epidemic.
in this period. So those are the implications. It's very exciting data. Uh, we, we love collaborating with our friends in Maine and we'd like to thank uh, everybody else who has contributed to this data so far, including Thomas Berkowitz who created that map and uh, undergraduate, graduate and postdoctoral -doc scholars who have contributed to this data and, uh, and our staff. So that's that. By way of wrapping up, I'd like to just help us realize how far we've come in 10 years from the uh, moment when Michael McElroy, Paul Majewski, and I met and we started to think about whether it was even possible for historians to talk to climate scientists and productive and so and where we might go from there. It's been an extraordinary um, voyage, one can truly say, and uh, in some sense, we're really only at the beginning. Uh, we have this extraordinary new piece of data that has taken us uh, as far as you've heard today. I think in your questions, it will take us further. Thank you, thank you. And just by way of suggesting how far we co we've come, I just want to go back to the beginning. That meeting 10 years ago that produced the first effort to use proxy data from the Greenland ice cores to compare it closely and rigorously with historical records, which produced at first to our surprise, a correlation with volcanic eruptions, which led to an article in Speculum that was really a, a, a multi-group uh, and multidisciplinary correlation. I think this was the first article in Speculum, that, which is the <laughs> big journal in medieval studies in the United States and North America. It was the first journal article in there to have more than two authors who were not married to each other. We had to do a lot of explaining. Uh, and uh, it was just tremendous fun. This was the first thing that showed that it was possible and gave real results. That led to the same group of, uh, and a larger group of uh, co-conspirators to come together in the wonderful circumstances at Dumbarton Oaks to see whether we could do something with the existing proxy data to try to reconstruct the big picture of climate change under the Roman Empire. Uh, it was a very exciting time. There we took the proxy data and we talked about it for 45 minutes after talking about it all day and the night before. And then I went out and gave the results with everybody sitting behind me with uh, 20 minutes of preparation. So that was quite thrilling. The result of that, nevertheless, was with much hard work after that was the first scientifically grounded multi-proxy reconstruction of climate change over the long period of the Roman Empire from 100 uh, BC to 800 AD. And that has led now to this wonderful collaboration of the science of the human past with the Climate Change Institute at the University of Maine, with the University of Heidelberg, University of Fribourg, and with our youngest scholars all the way to our more senior scholars here, doing this wonderful new instrumental record that we've just begun to grapple with and we're really looking forward to getting your, your thoughts on it. I just want to underscore to you that this really is the first proxy data from the heart of the Roman Empire. On a clear day, you can see Turin. You can see Italy from this record. And uh, if you compare it to where the others came from, uh, you can see that uh, we're much closer to the heart of things and where the records are coming from. And a very big part of uh, what we're doing, the historical records that Alex showed you, as he underscored, is the creation of a team largely of undergraduates with really great undergraduate and graduate uh, leadership, uh, 10 students and one pr professor at the last uh, count, and hopefully there'll be more students coming to join us because the challenges are great. There's a lot of work and a lot of fun ahead of you, ahead of us and ahead of you. So with no further ado, I'd like to ask uh, maybe Paul and Nikki uh, and Alex to come up and, and take a seat and let's open the floor to questions. Pascal can join us. He's been watching patiently uh, from Heidelberg. It's getting later and later and he's a, a noble. And I can use this microphone here and Matt can come and join me if, as, as needed, okay? Can you hear, can you hear us, Pascal? You can. Yes, you, you can, can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. You're in. Yeah, I, I, I had a problem. I couldn't see the screen either. We tried it before. It was uh, unfortunate. I couldn't really see the presentation. 
Oh. But I hope you can I hope you can see me and hear me yeah, all right. Yeah, we can see you. Yeah, we can see you. Okay. Well, okay. That, like that's dog. life at the Intercontinental Internet. <laughs> okay. Yeah, can you turn the, the camera back on, though? So that, I... The camera. Questions? Eric. Okay, Eric, if you could identify yourself. And uh, Eric Tamre, senior from the Earth and Planetary Sciences Department here. Um, I want to ask about the resolution of the ice ah. core. We saw from, from Alex Moore's presentation, and he mentioned briefly that at least the Delta 18 0 record has a decadal um, resolution. And when looking at the 1257 event, for example, you could see the, um, the value of Delta 018 falling indeed for about 10 years before the, the actual event. What is limiting our resolution? Is it post-depositional mixing within the, within the snow before it, it, it's made into glacier ice? What are the processes regulating that? And do they apply differently to different kinds of proxies that we might be interested in from the ice core? We might be looking at other things than Delta 18L. Pascal should answer that. Oh, Pascal. Yeah, you, you yeah, I'd be happy to. I can, I can see now. It's uh, perfect. So <laughs> we, can't, we can't see you, but that's fine. We can hear you. Ah. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. So for just, that. just to make sure, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll reiterate the question one more time. Um, so you, you were asking, what's the uh, fundamental limitation in resolution for the delta eighteen signal as far as its interpretation uh, as atmospheric temperature is concerned? Is that correct? Yes. So um, the main reason is that because of the very irregular deposition, um, the we get a large amount of noise on any atmospheric imprint on these signals. And the story is that for the stable water isotopes, um, this noise is, com in comparison to the actual signal, very large. Um, which makes it very difficult to decipher um, the, the atmospheric variability in temperature over this large amount of noise component that you have from year to year. And by comparison with instrumental temperature data, we were able to show that nonetheless, beyond a time scale of about 10 years or so, the on average signal is the same as instrumental temperature. So for the stable water isotopes, it's more or less in the, the, the resolution um, is not the, the main issue. It's rather this um, um, the question, can we make up a very small signal that's buried in a large amount of noise? Now, for other impurities, we have seen the ammonium, for example, also for sulfate, the on average signal the trend, for example, over 10, 20 years, it's, it's much larger. Uh, and the relative amount of noise is smaller. For the, uh, therefore, for impurities, the story is slightly different. Um, and that's basically also the signal that we measure with the laser. It's um, uh, rather an impurity signal. It's not the stable water isotopes. So that's why I think we can go here to s much smaller and smaller timescales and have a better chance of uh, finding the atmospheric imprint whereas it's fundamentally limited with the uh, stable water isotopes. And just one more thing with the stable water isotopes, we have one other fundamental lim uh, limitation, and that's the effect of diffusion. Um, you might have noticed it that in the, in the blue curve in this, um, uh, or I, I think it, w it, it should be blue on the, should have been blue on the, on the plots. Um, the, there is no year to year variability. It, it's just a sort of smooth signal. And um, that's, uh, one reason is the way it was measured on meltwater, and the other reason is that the isotopes tend to diffuse, so any large gradients that take place on a small spatial scale with a large amount of time will start to just become smoother and smoother to diffuse out. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, just to add to that, though, because that was only part of your question, uh, if you were to superimpose on that, which was, did not appear there, uh, the sulfur data, uh, you would have seen the 1257 event very clearly. 
you would superimpose lead data, calcium data, iron data, as based on those annual signals that, that you saw before. The resolution for those measurements is 120 microns, which translates to several hundred samples per year, at least 100 or 200 samples, even in the, in the highly compressed areas. So while the water isotope signal is, in fact, significantly diffused uh, and has noise in it, these others, if we believe that the annual layer counting is good, and we do because we've calibrated it, you can see the length of the, clearly the length of the summer, the no, potentially the number of storm events. You should, if you went back 2,000 years ago, which we can, uh, see the onset of smelting uh, by the Romans and actually find out how much they did relatively from one year to the next, optimistically. But to answer your question, the resolution for, for almost everything else is 120 microns. Steve Gullum, I'm a DNA scientist. This is outside my realm a bit. Are you seeing a clear signal from human activity compared to, say, Greenland or something like that? that you, I mean, you can't identify specifically what it means, but just a difference that you could attribute to human activity. That's already been actually demonstrated by others in the cold and fatty core. You okay. see a, a rise in uh, sulfate with in early 1900s. Uh, you see increases in lead as automobiles begin to go. Uh, that that came out very nicely from the last from the record that only covers the last 200 to 300 years. Curious. In your record, are you saying the same thing? Yes. Oh, yeah. Ab absolutely. Uh, and in fact, we have synthesis papers. You, in the case of lead, which is very interesting, you can see uh, the increase in lead in, in a place like Alaska uh, actually lasting longer because it's coming from Asia, which introduced lead abatement. Mm -hmm. 10, 15 years after North America and Europe did. So I always like to say, you really can't escape ice cores. Uh, if you did it, it's, it's a good chance it'll be in an ice core. Mike McElroy, please. So I'm, I, I must say congratulations. This is an amazing, uh, amazing cooperation, amazing uh, performance. I, I was wondering a couple of uh, questions, really. Um, one was um, the oxygen 18 is really a somewhat complicated signal. I mean, it's not just local temperature. It's the processing of air masses and the selective. Uh, it, it, are you able to uh, look at um, a comparison of modern data for which you actually have meteorological information from the site to really see exactly what, how good a proxy this really is? And, and the second question was, um, you know, I think what's really as exciting is to try to relate uh, the changes that you see at this particular site, obviously also to what you see in Greenland, but, but then to relate it to um, large-scale meteorological phenomena such as the Atlantic Meridional Circulation, which will give us a real sense of, uh, of uh, interesting changes. Um, th this is a wonderful performance. Thank you. The, the quick answer to the water isotope question is, is yes, and, and that's already been done. You're absolutely correct. Uh, in the, when you go outside of the polar regions and even in the polar regions, the temperature association with water isotopes is, is certainly not straightforward. However, the correlation in this particular case is quite good. It's far from 100 percent. Um, you mentioned the Greenland record. One of the interesting th things about Col Nefeti, one of the unfortunate interesting things, that it primarily captures a summer record. The interesting thing about Greenland is it primarily captures a winter spring record. So, and obviously the two are teleconnected uh, circulation systems. So we hope it'll be possible to actually buffer uh, literally the entire, uh, the entire year in the process. And uh, we've already done the calibrations with the reanalysis record for Greenland, and we get strong calibra uh, strong uh, variance explained on the order of 70% for the relationship between sea salt and the Icelandic low, uh, for the relationship between crustal potassium uh, and the Siberian high. So the, we're really hopeful that in the future we'll be able to, to pin down these circulation patterns. And with the laser technology, we hope that we'll actually be able to talk about individual storm events so that it will be possible to say that during one year there were many, many more storm events than other years, what the, what the length of the season was, at least in Greenland and Colonifetti, we can't. Is, is this 
uh, one of the really interesting uh, current topics in uh, trying to understand the climate record, the recent climate record, is the so-called hiatus in temperatures, global average temperatures over the last decade or so. Mm -hmm. And um, you know the the interesting suggestion is that um, it, it's not that uh, the Earth was not gaining energy over this last decade. It is that a significant fraction of that energy was deposited deeper in the ocean. So it had less of an effect on the surface temperature and a deeper effect on the ocean. And the uh, suggestion is that perhaps the, the uh, relatively slow change in uh, temperature that occurred from about 1940 to 1970 reflected, in, again, another one of these uh, changes, probably linked in a complicated way to the Atlantic uh, meridional circulation. So it seems to me the really interesting possibility, given the amazing data source that, uh, that you have uh, you know, put together here, is to try to extend that record back and try to see exactly uh, how, how common these changes are going back as far as you can go. Absolutely, and that's one of the exciting things because this is obviously so close to, to the historical records. Um, our work in Antarctica has helped to demonstrate how the increased strength of the westerlies has in fact changed surface ocean, uh, uh, the, the uh, upwelling in the, of the southern ocean, which as you know is heating right down to, uh, down to its uh, lowest, most depths. So there are a lot of exciting parallels once we're able to look at naturally occurring warm and, and, and cold events, how people responded to them. And this, uh, the work that Alex did that he showed the, the relationship between the fact that the climate was actually weakening people's ability uh, to fight disease is very, very exciting. Hi, I'm Don Goldman. I was invited by Alex because I teach about bubonic plague in SLS 26, and I was uh, I, I put a graphic up on microclimate changes in this period uh, for about uh, eight years now, not understanding it very well, not having much evidence. So this is really really helpful. Uh, I, it's very exciting. Uh, I, I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist, and so I have to ask a question from an epidemiologic point of view. Uh, so there's this very interesting association between the wet period and the low temperatures, the bad harvests, and uh, plague uh, incidents and mortality. Uh, as you know, plague reoccurred in Europe uh, multiple times uh, following 1348. Uh, and, uh, you know, the usual epidemiologic principles, you want to show consistency. So if you look at those other periods where plague was epidemic in Europe, uh, do you see the same thing in terms of harvests, ice cores, temperatures, and so forth? Um, the answer is not straightforward. Um, as usual in history. Um, first of all, the, the our, our uh, historical record of climate events and reports is uh, does not go beyond 1500. So we haven't we haven't done that yet. We will plan on expanding it in the future, uh, provided funding and 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 manpower is available. Um, but it doesn't go that far yet. Now, what um, part of the argument of the Carmichael ar article that I showed uh, earlier is that there are um, what she calls uh, reserves of, of vectors carrying the plague. And she, in fact, argues that these are in mountain villages uh, right around Colin and Becky. It's right below it. Uh, so that, there was a reason why I put that article there, besides the fact that Nan is a dear friend of mine. Uh, and I thought that the article was great. Um, so the argument from that article is that the disease falls and comes down seasonally. And in fact, it is seasonal, as you well know, uh, over the course of two or three centuries beyond that. Um, so that's, that's the first theory and the first challenge. The second challenge is that um, while it was recurrent, as you know, the death rates are, were uh, less uh, uh, um, uh, devastating as, as uh, the plague went on, even the second wave, where we don't have uh, uh, death rates as, um, that, that you know, took out half of the population of Europe. 
So, um, again, it's, it's a different phenomenon. Um, and, and while, when, when, we, when we think about the fact that half, you know, think about in the United States, 320,000, 320 million people, half go. You got 150 million people. What happened immediately economically was that there was a lot more wealth to go around, including food. Um, and a lot less manpower, which meant higher salaries. So the, the, it's a, a different phenomenon to be studied. And um, I, I'm, I'm, I haven't even began, begun to uh, conceptualize what the implications of bad harvests, bad weather are. That said, we know the weather gets worse and worse over the course of uh, the, what historians have now uh, began, began to call the Little Ice Age. And we know from colonial America that, that uh, the weather was terrible when uh, Puritans and Pilgrims landed. So uh, my guess would be uh, that there will be similar associations. Uh, we would have to look at, and you know, the data only gets better epidemiologically. We get uh, better and better um, records of uh, mortality and morbidity. Uh, you know, John Grant's first uh, first uh, tables of uh, mortality. Uh, what what better record do you want? Uh, uh, if I could just follow up on that. So, so you're asking, if I understood correctly, whether there are parallel cases in which we see uh, specific types of climate uh, change that seems to be chronologically associated with uh, outbreaks of the bubonic plague. Yeah, I mean, just the counterfactual would be that there's a very warm period within this general cold period. I mean, you, it showed some spikes there where actually the harvests were apparently very good, or at least the bar was very short, and the temperatures weren't all that cold that particular year. If, if you find counterfactuals with right. five good years, right. and the plague is devastating London and Charles can't get coronated, which is what happened, then you've got a problem. Yeah, yeah, I, no, uh, uh, certainly. So these are things that we will be able to explore as our, our record becomes more robust. I can give you a, uh, a positive uh, confirmation, if you will, from the first pandemic of plague, the Justinianic plague, which was robustly identified on biomolecular evidence to be Yersinia pestis uh, two years ago, one year ago uh, now, and, and there's further evidence probably coming along those lines. And in July, a very interesting paper was published, uh, the co-author is here in the audience, uh, on the uh, major uh, volcanic uh, eruptions of 536, 540, and 547, uh, which uh, in another paper, which has just been submitted, um, is shown to correspond to a very sharp uh, decrease in summer temperature beginning in 536, sufficient that um, the period beginning in 536 and running to about 680, 660, 680 could, should be uh, called a late antique little ice age. And this is five years before the outbreak of the Justinianic pandemic, the same disease in remarkably, strikingly similar uh, climatic conditions. So we need to continue and to look for the counterfactual, as you rightly emphasize, but there's a very interesting parallel soon to emerge. To my great relief, unlike the people at the time, it turns out it's not the comet. <laughs> no, no, it's not the comet. No, no, it was not a comet. We now know that the, the volcanic uh, Francis Ludlow is here and contributed to that paper, and he can discuss. But Tephra, again, has been used to identify the 536 eruption as originating in volcanoes in California. Andre uh, tells me it looks pretty good from the point of view of Tephra. Um, Henry and John. Uh, first of all, as exciting as promised. Um, but a question for Alex really is that in the, in the written sources that we have, s there are so many different explanations for why famine occurs and why bad harvests occur. I mean, it can be, it can be anything. And I'm just wondering what, when you look at this graph that, that shows it's so correlated with this one measure of summer temperature, how you sort of maintain a sense of skepticism or, or how, how you factor in how many different ways that this can happen or whether that calls into question sort of the, the reasons that we have to believe or why people say that famine occurs. Hmm. Um, by the way, I didn't map famines. Or bad harvests. Yeah. Sorry. Famines are not up there. Um, 
and uh, the first uh, degree of skepticism um, that you may have you may have noticed is the fact that I did not use the word correlation, uh, because just uh, an hour earlier I was uh, put in my place uh, and said don't use that word, uh, and and, it's, and I was really just rushing uh, at the time, but um, so. I, I'm really not ready to say this, this, there is a correlation. Um, and I do maintain skepticism. I, I, I do think that we need further analysis, and especially the sulfur. I mean, if, if, I, if I had the sulfur to, to match and also tephra, then we, we really can start looking at, at uh, uh, some really solid um, uh, comparisons. That's hard. That are ar harder to argue with. But your art question is: How do you maintain skepticism against um, harvests? Well, the way that I mean they, that 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 I do it is uh, I I look for more evidence. Uh, and in my case, I look for prices of grain, uh, which is what I've worked on for too many years, uh, and uh, I have a database of almost equally as many uh, records of um, grain, r r that is rye, wheat, and other food, all agricultural products. And if manipulated properly, and I think I will need some assistance with that, um, because I am an economic historian, but not, not at this level, uh, there, is, there is in fact an indication that also prices of, for food go up. Of course, those are, those are twice removed proxies, right? Because there is the bad harvest, and then there is also economic uh, forces. In my case, for example, I studied those forces, uh, policies that lowered prices artificially in order to maintain uh, a steady supply of food. But the answer in this in business is always, especially when we are uh, collaborating with scientists, the, the answer is always get more evidence, get more evidence. And, and you know, and, and don't discard anything ever. Um, but looks promising. Awesome, thank you. Hi, um, I just had a quick question. Um, if there is this uh, not correlation but association, as you say, between uh, the uh, between the amount of precipitation and the spread of plague. I was wondering if there's any sense that we get that the historical sources are associating wetness with plague. And the reason why this came to mind is because currently I'm also in McCormick's seminar on the, the Justinianic plague right now. And one thing that I think that I've been seeing is that they actually associate it far more with dryness and with heat, which might re represent more the seasonality of the plague itself than the, uh, the effects of a general wetter climate. But I'm just curious whether you see any association that the historical sources are, might be aware of any uh, connection between wetness mm. and spread of plague. So as a historian of medicine, I can tell you that that's the outlier. Um, the outlier is in fact the, the associating dry conditions with disease. The, the, the historically, uh, the most common, uh, you know, I, I just rushed in from a, a teaching a seminar on health, water, and disease, really just now. And we were in fact discussing how uh, the US government went after uh, swamp lands and, and uh, reclaimed them, uh, and one of the pretexts was uh, the public health, um, improving public health. And so mal area, bad air, obviously, um, you know, miasmatic theory of disease was pervasive, but that comes and as we were just saying earlier when we met, you know, the, 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 there is more malaria, bad air, not the disease necessarily, in areas where it's warmer. And this is, this is understood in, in a sense, in a historical sense, not a, as a, as, as a scientist. I'm not saying this is a scientist. Historically, people understood right. disease to be associated with humid places. Uh, and and uh, so... Now, in reality, does this actually translate? Um, Anne, I, Anne Carmichael uh, suggested this, um, and she cited pretty solid scientific evidence that, that indicated that please do love a wet summer, and so do gerbils and, and rats. And gerbils seem to be, in fact, the ones uh, uh, that, that we're leaning more towards, perhaps because they're cuter. Um, 
don't know why, but it made it a New Yorker. Uh, so, you know, uh, there's something there. Um, I, I, I don't know the science that well. I've read all the papers. They seem very solid. Such a dose. Last question before we yeah. move on to the uh, just one one more data point that you might want to look at in uh, the plague that hit uh, northern Italy in the 1630s. Uh, there were bread riots in Milan just before that. Mm -hmm. So and there'd been a major crop failure, and, and I'm not sure its extent. But you probably have access to much better data than than I remember. Oh, I mean, there are bread riots all over with it, with every epidemic, uh, because of course the the um, the I mean, it, epidemics are prevalently prevalently a er, more of an urban problem, uh, especially in this period where the population density is a lot lower. Um, however, there are bread riots nonetheless. They, eventually, they arrive because uh, the manpower dies out, or there is less. And so there's just no food. The only places that, in fact, avoid bread riots are places that have a provisioning system in place that bring, brings uh, the, the grain uh, from um, other lands. Uh, in this particular context, I'm sorry, I'm going to plug it. It's Venice. It's the only, uh, that's my, my research, and it's the Republic of Venice. It's the only one that actually has no bread riots. It's been shown that it is the, that the, it, it lives through these crises a lot a lot more uh, smoothly as opposed to for example Florence or Milan and Florence in the 14th century Milan in the 16th century 17th century um, it's it's yeah absolutely it's all in there uh, and uh, it confirms it okay so I can see that there are more questions, but I think that we can continue the questions in a nice reception next door. I would propose that we thank our speakers for having shared courageously with us data that is really at the cutting edge, at the very, it is just emerging from our computers and uh, ICP device, cryo chambers and what have you. Um, so thank, please, the people who have come together to, to begin this discussion with you, and let's continue the conversation over drinks next door. Thank you very much. And Pascal, it, I think it's midnight in Heidelberg, and you are one very brave scientist. <laughs> Thank you, friend. And you don't even get the drink. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you. Thank you.